Believe it or not, Russell Wilson is starting to become Drew Brees. And I don't mean that in the sense that they're both short, strong-armed quarterbacks who could be MVP finalists year after year. I mean that in the sense that they both should be MVP finalists year after year, but aren't. It's become a bit of a pet peeve of mine lately that the NFL MVP award is seemingly less about who is actually the most valuable player in the league and more about who is the most valuable player on the best team in the league. For a long time this season, I had touted Eagles quarterback Carson Wentz as my personal vote for MVP, and for a long time, I had thought the Eagles to be a better overall team than the Seahawks as well. Hell, I still think Philly is overall a better team than Seattle, even after their loss on Sunday night. But to me, what makes an MVP an MVP is being able to carry a worse team to a win over a better team. That's where the valuable part of most valuable player comes from, or at least that's where it's supposed to come from. The Seahawks have no running game, shaky at best pass protection, and only one functional member of the Legion of Boom left standing, and yet Wilson just toppled the kings of the NFC in primetime like it was nothing. Did that banged up Seattle defense play out of its collective mind against Philly's offense? Absolutely, but it was Wilson's steady presence and ability to sustain crucial drives that really won that game. After Sunday night, Wilson has now accounted for an insane 80% of Seattle's total offensive production. He also leads the Seahawks in rushing by a huge margin with 432 yards. Second place, in case you were curious, is Chris Carson, who has not played since week four and has less than half of Wilson's total at just 208 yards. Just think about that. We're now in week 14 of the NFL season and no running back on the Seahawks active roster has passed 200 total yards yet. That's almost impressively bad, and yet still here they are at 8-4, commanding a playoff spot as always against all the odds. Statistically speaking, when you look at the numbers for both the Eagles and Seahawks, Seattle should not have won this game. They were underdogs in their own stadium for only the second time in the last five years for a reason. But if you set aside those numbers and look at the tape, and you really study how Wilson carried this team to victory, I'm actually surprised they didn't win by more than just two touchdowns. The Seahawks' offensive game plan and overall execution against Philly was simply spectacular. They knew they wouldn't be able to run the ball very effectively. We're more than three months into the year now. Trust me, they are well aware of what they can and cannot do. And that's why they resorted to other methods to keep the offense on schedule and move the chains, primarily the spread passing game. Wilson and his offensive coordinator, Daryl Bevel, used a lot of empty sets and short passing concepts as an extension of the run game. It was a way to simulate those four, five, and six yard gains that you get from running the ball without actually trying and inevitably failing to run the ball. 75% of Wilson's completions in this game were within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage, and a quarter of all his dropbacks were from empty formations, meaning no running backs were in the backfield. Despite being ahead in this game from start to finish, Seattle's leading rusher Mike Davis only got 16 carries. 16! That's how little faith they had in this run game to chew clock and keep the chains moving. They put it all on Wilson to protect their lead against the best team in the league, and he delivered. What I think I liked the most about the Seahawks' execution of this game plan was how much they exploited the Eagles' favoritism for man coverage and pressure. They knew that Jim Schwartz was going to come into this game, man everybody up across the board, put a spy on Wilson, and try to bring pressure with that front four, and that's exactly what he did. And of course, the way to beat that style of defense is to do exactly what Bevel did in response. Call plays that get the ball out quickly and create early separation with rub concepts that nullify man coverage. Seattle was running rub concepts constantly, which fit well into their overall plan of relying on the short passing game as a substitute for the running game. We'll look at this play from the second quarter as an example. It's first and 10 at the start of a new drive, and the Seahawks are in their most used formation of the day, gun wing slot, meaning Wilson's in the slot, the tight ends are in a wing, and both receivers are twins left with Doug Baldwin of course lining up in the slot. This formation is a great indicator of man coverage versus zone coverage because both wide receivers are on the same side of the field. The Eagles are in their three safety nickel package, and while yes they do have a corner covering Jimmy Graham, which is usually an indicator for zone, they also have a safety Malcolm Jenkins covering Baldwin in the slot. Keep in mind that the Eagles defense is different than most others. Their alignment rules and what they indicate are kind of backwards. Safeties covering slot receivers and corners covering tight ends are not automatic red flags for zone like they would be for a lot of other defenses. In fact, because Jenkins is not only their best safety but also their best man coverage defender in the slot, his presence in front of Baldwin actually indicates man coverage. Schwartz is usually only going to put Jenkins in that spot for one of two reasons. Either he's in man and he's supposed to take away the slot receiver, or he's disguising a blitz. Every other scenario goes against their tendencies, so Jenkins' alignment tells Wilson all he needs to know about the defense in front of him. And that's where the rub concept comes into play. 
Because Wilson knows that the Eagles are in man coverage, he knows that his best matchup on this play is Mike Davis on the flat route. Davis's man defender, Michael Kendricks, is being forced to work through a lot of traffic because of these tight ends that are releasing on their routes in front of him. So it's going to be virtually impossible for him to get to Davis before he gets the ball, which is of course the whole end goal of a rub concept in the first place. And because it's not zone coverage and there are no zone defenders near him in the flat, he gets to make an easy, uncontested catch and run for nine yards. Like I said before, the Seahawks knew from the start that they would not be able to run the ball against this defensive line, so they took the defensive line out of the equation entirely and got Davis on the edge with a pass instead. They used the pass game as an extension of the run game and rub routes are what made that possible. Hell, two of Seattle's touchdowns on Sunday night were thrown inside of 11 yards from the end zone and both of them were off of rub concepts. Four years ago, anything inside that 15 yard line was all Marshawn Lynch territory. Now, that's Jimmy Graham and Doug Baldwin territory. Their identity is completely different, and it's because Russell Wilson is so good that he allows their identity to be completely different. Now, all that being said, what about the non-underneath throws? We've already established that 75% of Wilson's completions traveled less than 10 yards through the air. What about the other 25%? Well, most of them weren't much longer to be honest. One was that 11 yard touchdown to Jimmy Graham that you just saw. Two of them were bootlegs to Nick Vanette that traveled 12 and 13 yards respectively. And another was a 15 yard touchdown pass to JD McKissick from yet another empty formation. But the fifth one, the only other completion that traveled more than 10 yards, was also Seattle's only completed deep pass of the evening, a 47 yard beauty to Doug Baldwin on third and 10. This play was an excellent reminder that even though the Seahawks may be surviving these days by relying on the short passing game, Russell Wilson is still one of the most dangerous deep ball passers in the league and still just as fearless in the pocket as ever. Here's how it happened. Look at where the Eagles are lined up. Kendricks is standing up off the edge showing pressure, so Philly is obviously bringing at least five rushers here. But as Wilson is going through his cadence, watch Malcolm Jenkins slide over from the slot and try to bring another blitz right up the gut. Wilson smartly recognizes it, stops his cadence and makes an adjustment on the fly, as all quarterbacks should do, but Jenkins is still showing blitz even after that adjustment. Wilson knows just from Jenkins continuing to linger over the middle that he's now got man-to-man -man coverage across the board with possibly a seven-man pressure package in his face. But believe me, while that sounds bad, if you give Doug Baldwin man-to-man -man coverage on third and ten and Wilson has enough time to find him, pressure or no pressure, they will burn your defense to the ground. I think the high sideline angle from the broadcast view really captures their connection the best. Wilson is staring at Baldwin the entire time as he hustles through his drop to get away from the rush. He does not know before the snap who exactly will be covering him, but he does know that someone will be on Baldwin one-on-one, -on -one, and that's a matchup he'll take every single time. On this play in particular, Rodney McLeod was who drew that short straw, and unfortunately for him, he was also lined up with huge inside leverage against an outside breaking route, so he was already at a massive disadvantage to begin with. Wilson sees McLeod's leverage immediately, and he knows halfway through his drop that he's got him dead to rights. He just needs to throw it before the blitz gets to him. Baldwin runs an excellent double move at the top of his route and burns that inside leverage, a nod corner move to be more specific, meaning he's giving a little nod and a little shake inside to freeze McLeod in place, and then he darts back outside on the corner route with nobody over the top to stop him. Honestly, McLeod had no shot here one on one, and Jim Schwartz probably knew that even when he called this blitz. This play call was entirely relying on that seven man pressure package to rattle Wilson before he could get the ball out, but he stayed poised just long enough to turn the tables and punish them for it instead. It was almost like a game of chicken, really. Schwartz gambled that they could get Wilson before he got them, and that gamble did not pay off. Whether it was the short passing game, the deep passing game, the zone read running game, or just flat out not catching Wilson in the backfield when they had their chances, nothing that Jim Schwartz tried worked. While he didn't have the flashiest stats ever and the scoreboard wasn't blown up like it was against Houston or Indianapolis, last Sunday's game against the Eagles may have been the best MVP type performance by Russell Wilson all season long. He maintained control of the game from start to finish against, at least on paper, a vastly superior team. He reasserted his franchise back into the battle for the NFC West, and he showed that even with no run game and barely an offensive line, he can still move the ball and give his defense a lead to work with. Just like with Drew Brees, I think we tend to get so used to the extraordinary when looking at Russell Wilson that we start to think games like this are ordinary. They aren't. Nothing about Russell Wilson or his ability to completely carry his offense is ordinary. He does everything for them, and I mean everything. Not being on the best team in the league should not hurt him when it comes to MVP voting, but it does every single year. I get the love for Tom Brady. I love Tom Brady too, and of course I get the love for Carson Wentz as well. Hell, I was part of the MVP hype for Wentz in the first place. 
but if you want to be an MVP caliber quarterback, you have to beat MVP caliber quarterbacks. That's what Russell Wilson has done his entire career. The MVP award is not a team achievement. It's supposed to go to the one player that you know, beyond any doubt, is carrying their football team. If anything, it's the anti-team achievement. It's an award that's recognizing that there's a team out there who would be utterly terrible without this one player to make up the difference. For once, the football media landscape needs to recognize what Russell Wilson has been doing up in Seattle. And for once, they need to put the valuable back into most valuable player. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode brought to you again by our friends over at the Bet DSI Sportsbook. They have been incredibly supportive of this channel and right now and for the rest of the season, all Film Room viewers can get a free $25 wager credit to get your feet wet and try to make some real cash betting on these games every Sunday. You do not pay anything to sign up with this promo code and any money you win with that free wager credit is yours to keep. You can cash out your winnings at any time, you can keep them and try to turn them into even more money, whatever you do with them is completely 100% up to you. So if you want to make some extra cash for this holiday season, head on over to BetDSI.com, enter promo code FILM25 and see how much you can win. As for me, I'll be back later this week with my week 14 picks. Uh, week 13 had more losses than I expected because teams like the Ravens and Lions can't decide if they actually want to be good or not, but uh, at least I got that Jets win right, so there's that. Silver linings, I guess. But anyway, I'll be back in a couple days with those picks. Stick around for that, and until then, later.